What's up castaways, this is Miles Away. Welcome back to another video. Now today, we're gonna be ranking every single hardware synth that I've ever owned. Now before we begin, let's go over the rules. So rule number one, I will not be including a synth that I haven't played. So popular synths like the Arturia Microfreak or Hydra synth are nowhere to be found on this list, although I am sure they are great. For a synth to make this list, it has to be a synth that I've either owned, rented, or borrowed for a long enough period of time that I can make a fair assessment of it. Number two, for the tiers, anything B or above, I think is a great synth that I would unequivocally recommend to everyone, with S tier being obviously my favorites. And anything that's a C tier, I would still recommend, but just to specific people who are after that kind of sound. And anything D or below, I unfortunately would not recommend. Next up, this tier list will focus only on modern hardware synths, which means that there's no vintage synths and no soft synths. But if you guys want to see tier lists on both of those topics and you like this kind of video, let me know in the comments and I will make those in the future. Finally, I should probably not have to say this, but this is 100% my subjective opinion. And if you disagree with me, that's great. Let me know in the comments below where I got it wrong and where you would put some of these on your tier list instead. Thanks so much for watching guys. Remember to hit that like button, subscribe, and let's get started. First up, the Korg Prologue. Now, I'd tried many different synths, I'd rented many different synths, but the Korg Prologue was the first keyboard I ever purchased, so it will always have a soft spot in my heart. Now, you know, you might be thinking easy S tier for me based on how many videos I've made. However, in my last video, I kind of outlined some of the cons. It's not the most versatile synth because of the filter, and it does have a couple issues like only one LFO and a little bit of a limitation in other ways too. So I'm gonna give the Korg Prologue an A tier. Moving on, the Behringer Neutron. Now, the Neutron was one of my first synthesizers I bought as well. I bought it right at release, and I, I held on to it for over a year, about a year and a half, and I really enjoyed my time with it. Uh, however, there were just a few things I didn't like. I did find that the noise floor was pretty high on the Neutron, especially when using the delay or the distortion. And I did find that, as shallow as it might sound, that the layout and the way it looked just didn't inspire me as much as a lot of other synths. However, it does sound really good and the value is hard to beat. For that reason, I'm gonna go with B tier. I think it's a, a great synth. Behringer Neutron deserves a solid B tier. However, I did end up selling it for another piece of gear. Next up the modal cobalt 8 now the cobalt 8 you guys saw my recent video on it i think it's an awesome first synth it sounds amazing it's got a ton of versatility it's got an amazing onboard sequencer lots of modulation clearly laid out frankly it's one of the best digital synths i've tried uh, at least especially in this budget of under a thousand dollars that's really awesome um, so with the Cobalt 8, you know, I, I think that there are a couple things holding it back from being an S tier synth that some of the other keyboards on this list will have. Namely, it doesn't have the most character. It can sound like a lot of different synths, but it's not the synth that I'm going to reach for when I'm like, I want something that's going to have a huge amount of personality where right away someone's going to hear it and be like, yeah, that's, that's a Cobalt 8. No, that, I don't think that it has that kind of, that kind of sound to itself, although it does sound really great. Um, I also find that that just compared to some analog synths, we're getting so close, but just the detune and the slop just isn't quite there for that level of emotionality that I look for. However, it is still amazing. So for that reason, I'm gonna give the Cobalt 8 an A tier. Next up, the Sequential Prophet 6. Now, most of you guys know my love for the OB6, but what you might not know is that I actually spent a really long time debating between buying the OB6 and the Prophet 6 as my main studio workhorse flagship synth. Um, I ended up landing on the OB6, but I had enough time to rent the Prophet 6 and really get to know it that I completely fell in love with it and I think it's an incredible synth. When I think of an analog bread and butter synth that just has an amazing sound and is just timeless for a reason, I think of a Prophet. You know, so many hit records were made using the Prophet 5, so many modern hit records were made using the Prophet 6, and the sound of a sequential oscillator going into one of those classic Prophet 24 dB low pass filters will never get old. I can't not give the Prophet 6 an S tier, and whether it's a Prophet 5 or Prophet 6, I'm gonna get one of them one day, mark my words, it's gonna be mine, it will be mine in my studio. Next up, the Arturia Mini Brute. Now, I never made a video on the Mini Brute because I only had it very briefly. I picked up a used one for a price I just couldn't resist, and I immediately was so excited to get it home and to play with it, and it was not for me. I really did not like this synth. It only lasted about three months in my studio. 
Um, I think that there's a lot of things that the Arturia Mini Brute could do well. Like it could be a first synth to learn on and it does that really aggressive, overdriven brute sound pretty well. Although frankly, I think that if you want aggressive and overdrive, you're better off going for like a used Moog Sub Fatty, which sounds way richer and nicer. Um, the Arturia Mini Brute to me is one of the least interesting and least pleasant sounding analog synths I've tried. Um, add to the fact that it also had, at least the unit I had, had a bit of a shoddy build quality quality and it just was not for me um there was a couple of tracks that i used for backing parts with it but overall it's the quickest piece of gear that i've ever bought and sold and i really did not enjoy the the raw character sound at, or filter at all so for that reason i'm going to give the arturia mini brute a d sorry arturia i love you as a company but this one was this was not for me moving on the behringer model d uh, now, I actually only had the chance to rent a Model D because I already have a Sub 37 and I, I didn't really need it, but I, I couldn't resist just to try it out and get to know it. And my gosh, I am blown away by how good the Model D sounds from Behringer. Now, this is one of those synths that really reminds me that we're living in a golden age because for less than $300, you can get essentially the sound of a vintage Mini Moog so close, like 90% of the way there. And it's just in a portable form factor that can sit on your desktop. I think the Behringer Model D sounds incredible. And if I keep looking on Craigslist to see if one comes up for a really good deal. I will definitely buy one of these eventually. It's just not a priority right now. Easy A tier. Only reason it's not getting an S is because it's not an original design. The Dave Smith Instruments Pro 2. Now, this is a really hard one for me because as you guys can see, I still own the Pro 2, but I frankly rarely ever use it. It's probably my least used piece of gear in the entire studio. I do sometimes use it occasionally for the sequencer and for designing weird sounds, but I think that the Pro 2 really suffers from not really being sure what it wants to be. There's a fantastic video by Tim Shoebridge that says exactly this in much more eloquent words than I could ever say, but basically the Pro 2, it has a bunch of features that would make it a great mono synth, but then it has digital oscillators, which aren't the fattest starting point uh, for a mono synth. And then it also has a bunch of features that would make it a good poly synth, but because it tries to do both of these things and doesn't really commit to one, you're sort of ended up with this interesting synth that has a lot of great features, but also missing out on a lot of them. For example, as a poly synth, I don't like having to route everything through just one or two filters, I would rather have a filter per voice. So it allows me to, yeah, sure, I can do cool paraphonic sounds, but it's not great for those traditional bread and butter poly sounds that I would want to use. And then for a mono synth, it's really great for weird stuff because of the digital oscillators. But if I want to just get a really fat sounding bass, this thing is never going to sound as fat as my Moog. It's never going to sound as rich as something like a Pro One. It's just kind of in this weird in between spot. However, I know I'm ragging on it a lot, but I think that the sequencer alone is the best sequencer I've ever used on a synth. And even though I'm more of a, a DAW guy, I love using my DAW to sequence, I can't resist making really cool sequences with all the different modulation lanes and using interesting things like modulating tuned feedback, modulating the different filters and what kind of series they're gonna go in. The sequencer alone brings this thing to a B tier for me. I think that the Pro 2, I haven't figured out if I'm gonna sell it or keep it, but it's a really cool synth, it's unique, and it is unfortunately flawed as well, but it's still a great piece of gear. Next up, the Moog Sub 37. Now to me, this is probably one of my all time favorite synths. It's very near and dear to my heart. I've had it for about three years now. I graduated from the Sub Fatty to the Moog Sub 37. And my gosh, today, it's still one of my favorite synths. The Moog Sub 37 is just an absolute classic. It's like a Fender Stratocaster. It will never go to style. The sound is a modern refinement of Moog's classic sound. The hands-on controls are amazing. It's built like a tank. It's super aesthetic to look at. And there's a reason why pretty much every band that plays synths has one of these. They tour around with them. Everyone uses the Sub 37. It's an absolute classic for a reason, and it still sounds great to this day. Easy S tier. Okay, next up, we've got the Behringer TD3. Now, this is probably my most random purchase ever. I don't really know why I bought this. I don't even make acid music. I've used this thing probably uh, under 10 times, but I do have a lot of fun every time I use it. So I think with the Behringer TD3, it's a faithful recreation of the classic Roland module that was so popular for creating acid house and all sorts of great stuff like that. Uh, but it's such a limited synth, right? Like I think if you only want that flavor, you're going to love this thing, but because it has only one oscillator, one voice, very limited modulation and a really interesting filter that has lots of character, but isn't too versatile. 
This is one of those synths where you could probably honestly just get away with a really good plugin and save your cash for something that's a bit more interesting or versatile. I'm gonna give the Behringer TD3 a C, but I understand that that's just my personal opinion, and if you love Acid House, this is probably going in A tier for you. Next up, the OB6. Now I realized that the pictures were switched here, so I'm gonna bring that back and bring the Prophet 6 up here. But yes, the OB6, you guys can probably guess already, this is gonna be the easiest S tier for me of the entire list. I bought the OB6 about two years ago, and to this day, it's my all-time favorite synthesizer. I use it on every single Miles Away release, and I know it like the back of my hand. There's just something so warm and so organic and so human about when I play the OB6. The ideas in my head, they come out sounding better than they did in my head when I use this synth, and I think, to me, that's like the ultimate goal for a piece of gear. If it can take what you're inspired to play when you play it and make it sound even better than how it sounds in your head, that's a huge win for me. The OB6 is just an absolute classic and it will stay with me to my grave. I've made three videos on it already and I'll probably be making another one once I get my OBX8, a big long comparison where we can compare the two synths. I love Oberheim's and I will forever have any OB as an S tier synth for me. Next up, the Dreadbox Nymphus, or Nymphs. Someone corrected me in the last video, I'm still not really sure. I'm gonna keep saying Nymphus because I'm not sure, but if it is Nymphs, I'm sorry in advance. So the Dreadbox Nymphus is a really cool little synth. I uh, obviously did a video on it really recently. I think there's a lot of great things about the Nymphus. I urge you to check out my other video if you haven't already, but the pros for me are the sound. It sounds absolutely incredible. And the overall features for the price and size are just insane. Um, highlights for me from the video where the filter is great, the oscillators and the modulation, the way you do modulation is really clever. And the fact that it has a polyphonic LFO for such a small and budget synth is incredible. Um, but obviously it is very limited in the sense that it has quite a bit of menu diving for the really complex features and also only one oscillator. But overall the Nymphus is a really solid synth. I'm gonna give the Nymphus a uh, B tier here. So I think the Nymphus could be kind of in between A or B. You know what? I'm, I'm hovering. No, I'm going to, I'm going to stay in B here. The, the strict reason is just because it's a great little synth on its own. And I think that as part of a larger setup, it's amazing, but I don't know that if I was streaming down my studio and just keeping only one synth, I don't think I would keep the Nymphus as that synth. It would probably be one of the ones to go because I can get pretty similar places with other gear, although it does sound really great. Next up, the Mini Moog Voyager. Now, I owned a Mini Moog Voyager for a while, a couple years ago. Um, I owned the old school version. Now, what I'm about to say might be a little bit controversial, but I really did find, and I've had the chance to play an original Mini Moog quite a bit, I found that the Voyager sounds more like my Matriarch than it did an original Mini Moog. Now, that's not necessarily a bad thing, but why I ended up selling the Mini Moog Model D, uh, sorry, why I ended up selling the Mini Moog Voyager is because I got my Matriarch. To me, the Matriarch sounds just as good, if not better, than the Voyager, and has a whole bunch of other features, like the modularity, the incredible analog delay. So for me, I actually am gonna give the Mini Moog Voyager a C. It's still a great synth, and I just wouldn't recommend it to everybody because I would urge people who are interested in a Voyager to check out the Matriarch. Now, that's just my opinion. If you love the Voyager, I'm really sorry. It's a great synth. I, I really enjoyed my time with it, but I just think that Moog just killed it with the Matriarch, and the Voyager just feels like a step backwards, which is why I sold mine. Next up, the Empress Zoya. So the most recent piece of gear on my list. Um, so I did a video on it last week. So I'm not gonna be talking about the Zoya in terms of like an effects pedal here. I'm talking about it just in terms of its synthesis capabilities. Now, obviously we have a dilemma here. So the dilemma is that the Zoya can do more than pretty much anything else on this list, but it's also the one with the most menu diving. So for that reason, I'm gonna give the Zoya a C because I think that the Zoya is so deep and so fascinating, but I wouldn't just recommend it if you just want it as a synth. If you just want it as a synth, you could probably get away with getting a semi-modular, like something from Behringer, like a Neutron or a Crave or a Mother 32. Um, the Zoya really excels because it's an effects pedal, a modular synth, it's everything you want it to be. But just as a standard, alone synth for generating tones in my music I don't use it that much next up we've got the two mini log brothers here so let's start with the XD so I didn't own an XD but I did rent it briefly to check it out and I might actually rent one again if I can get my hands on it to do a full preset pack so I do feel like I know the synth really well 
And this one might surprise some people, but to me, this is an easy S tier. The fact that Korg basically took everything that was good about the prologue and shrunk it down, made it more affordable, and added in an amazing sequencer, to me, this is like just one of the best and one of the easiest intro synths for me to recommend to people. The only reason I don't have one is because I have a prologue and I don't need the sequencer, but if I could go back in time, maybe I would have bought the Midilog XD instead of the prologue. It's just such an amazing value for what you get, and it sounds so good. They fixed my number one biggest gripe with the original mini log, which was the filter. So yeah, easy S tier on the XD. Next up, so for the original mini log, now this one I already mentioned, I wasn't a big fan of the filter. I think the mini log is just such an important synth in recent synth history because it got so many people into analog synths and it really brought back that analog resurgence in, in many ways. However, I don't think it's held the test of time necessarily as well as some of the other synths. It's by no means a bad synth, but just comparing it to the XD for a little bit more money, it just, it falls short in pretty much every other way. So I'm going to give the mini log uh, original a B tier because I think it was super important and it's still a great synth. If you can pick one up used, that's a great idea. But the XD to me just outclasses it in every single way. It's still a great synth, but yeah, that's my opinion there. Next up, the Modal Electronics Argon 8. Um, so the Argon it really excels at those interesting wavetable-y sounds, really glassy, kind of more different, not so much those traditional analog sounds, but it does sound really good, especially if you know how to program it. Um, so for the Argon 8, I find I don't use it quite as much as I use the Cobalt, uh, even for videos, just because I find a lot of the sounds that I like on the Argon, I can do uh, within uh, software sense, like Serum, quite easily, and therefore, I, I don't really feel inspired as much when I'm using the Argon as I do when I'm using the Cobalt. With that being said, it is a really great piece of gear and it still has the amazing build, amazing sequencer, amazing modulation and hands-on control that something like the Cobalt does have. Um, but just because I don't personally find it as inspiring as the Cobalt and I don't use it nearly as much, I'm going to go for a C tier for the Argon. It's really great. I would recommend it if you are specifically looking for that, but I can't recommend it to everyone, whereas with the Cobalt, easy recommendation for pretty much everyone. Next up, the Moog Grandmother. So the Moog Grandmother is just an absolute monster of a synth. It's again, similar to the Minilog XD. If you're looking for a first synth and have a little bit more cash to splurge on than you know the average first synth purchase, the Moog Grandmother is a great one you can't go wrong with. When I was deciding between the Matriarch and the Grandmother, I really just took a lot of time to play Grandmothers. I used them a lot at music stores. I even got to borrow one for a little while. And this thing is so intuitive. It sounds like incredible. It sounds like a million bucks. Again, sounds just as good as the Matriarch. But the reason why I went with the Matriarch is just because it's deeper. It has the paraphonic mode. And importantly, with the Grandmother, you have to give up your LFO if you want a third oscillator, which I really like the sound of like multiple Moog oscillators beating together. So for that reason, I'm going to give the Grandmother an A. I think it's a great synth, but there are just a few limitations that make it not quite S tier uh, compared to some of the others here. Um, limitations that I didn't like that much. Okay, getting close to the end here. So the next one is going to be the Moog Matriarch. Now, just the same way I talked about the Grandmother, the Moog Matriarch is incredible. It sounds so good, um, but it does just a little bit more than the Grandmother to warrant that S tier. Because for me, the, grand, uh, the Grandmother was a great start, but the Moog Matriarch was the synth I fell in love with. Those four oscillators, being able to patch them into any different way you want, changing the waveforms independently, having the two LFOs on board that you don't have to give up for if you want another oscillator. But if you can, you can use either of them as an oscillator as well. Like, how cool is that? You could have up to six oscillators if you're using external gear and modulating and patching things. The analog delay is just a thing of wonders. It sounds so good. And though, though people might think, oh, it's not that versatile, you know, it's got annoying global settings. Yes, it does. But now there is a web application for free where you can change the global settings. So that's no problem. And the versatility is actually way more than you would initially think. It can be used as a lead, a bass, for chords, for almost anything you'd want it to be because it's just, it sounds so damn good and it has so much character that if I want that Moog flavor, I, I just immediately will reach to it and it gets the job done. Amazing synth, I'm never going to sell mine. Next up, the oldest synth on this list, the Access Virus TI. While I never owned an Access Virus TI, this was the very first hardware synth that I completely fell in love with. I had an old peer that I used to make music with who brought this over to my studio regularly, and I got to borrow it for, for a while, and oh my gosh, this is what got me 
all of a sudden thinking, hey, you know what? I want to get out of the dog, get out of the software and buy some hardware synths. The Axis Virus TI sounds amazing. It's just an absolute classic virtual synth. And I keep looking on local Craigslist or Marketplace to see if there's a, a cheap one someone's looking to get rid of that I can buy and add to my collection. The Axis Virus, I think, is a little bit outdated now. It still sounds great, but um, just in terms of like the sound, it is very much that like virtual analog sound of the 2000s. Um, so if you want that, it's great. But I think, again, going back to some of the other um, the other kind of virtual analog and digital sense on this list, like the Cobalt, um, I think you can just get a little bit further and a little bit more high fidelity with your sound than you can now with the Axis Virus. Although I know there's a lot of people who just swear by this company and this synth. So I'm going to give the Axis Virus TI a B tier. Um, cool. Last two, Moog Sub Fatty. I am going to say that the Moog Sub Fatty is a great synth and sounds amazing, um, but I fully do not regret selling it for the Sub 37. It's just a little bit limited in terms of what you get to hands-on control, and it only has eight presets. If that's not important for you, it sounds amazing. Because of just how good it sounds and how, you know, you can get some for really great deals nowadays, I'm going to give the Sub Fatty a B. All right, so we're down to the last synth on the list here, and what better one to end off with than the Novation Summit? So the Novation Summit, I did a video recently on it. Um, it's just an absolute Swiss army knife of a synth. It's probably one of the synths that I use the most in my studio, just because of how versatile it is and how well I know it. It was super easy to learn, and it's super easy to get really complex sounds, but just the bread and butter sounds sound really good. A lot of the time, the issue that I have with you know these big workhorse flagship synths that can do everything is that they sound a little sterile on their own, but the Novation Summit sounds fantastic on its own. It's really, really good, and I think for that reason, I'm going to have to give it... This is actually a really hard one. Mm. I'm going to give it an A tier. Now, the only reason you're probably looking at it like, what? Why no S tier for the Summit? You're giving an S tier to, you know, something like the Moog Matriarch, which does so much less than the Summit, or the, the Prophet 6, which is very limited compared to the, uh, the Summit. The reason for that is that Yes, I reach for the Novation Summit all the time when I'm doing bread and butter sounds and when I'm kind of, you know, sketching out tracks really quickly. But if I'm still looking for a keyboard that inspires me, I'm still going to one of those keyboards in S tier before I'm going to the Summit. Because as great as the Novation Summit sounds and as much as I love to use it in my own tracks, it just doesn't quite have what the others in S tier have in terms of that unique character that makes it just stand out in a mix and makes me inspired when I'm playing it. Just in terms of the synths that inspire me and my own personal ranking, I just can't quite justify giving it an S tier compared to the others that are in S tier. But very, very high A. If there's a tier halfway in between S and A, the Innovation Summit would be there. Alright guys, so that brings my tier list to a close. How do you think I did? Do you agree with me? Do you disagree? Let me know in the comments and I will see you guys in the next video.